This morning, I'm thrilled to welcome Norm DeGrave, Chief Marketing Officer of CVS Health. And as all of us know, in this past year, Purposed has emerged as a clarion call for all brands and all leaders. We know we all need to articulate and live a compelling brand purpose. And this morning's conversation essentially, I hope, will be a masterclass in purpose. So let's begin, Norman. Uh, remarkable story, CVS Health, from the corner drug store to the largest healthcare company in America. Tell us what is the purpose statement, if you will, of CVS Health and the role of purpose in the evolution of the company? Sure. Uh, so the purpose is helping people on their paths to better health. And I should just talk about that for a second, because uh, there's a lot in those words that I think are useful for people who are trying to create their own purpose. Uh, the first is that it's an incredibly accessible statement, helping people on their path to better health. I didn't say achieve their best health. I didn't say anything that feels like nirvana. I, we have a statement that everyone in the company can understand I can do something today to help somebody on their path to better health. And so I, I said, I, I would recommend anybody thinking about a purpose statement, make sure that it feels accessible. The second piece that's really important about that statement is that it's about what we're doing for others, not what we're doing for ourselves. Uh, sometimes you'll hear mission statements, be the finest institution of whatever. That's maybe what you want. It's not really what your customers want. And so when you can find a purpose statement that actually is uh, about how you're going to do something for others, help them, you'll find a lot of engagement in it because it touches on our human spirit uh, that we actually do want to help others uh, in one way or another. So that, so that, that statement, which was developed, oh, coming up on nine years ago now, uh, has actually guided the whole evolution that you talked about from corner drugstore to, to, to largest healthcare company in, in America. Because when you believe that at its core, when you really want to help people on their path to better health, you can have it affect your acquisitions. You can have it affect your employee onboarding. It can affect your operations. It can affect everything that you do. And indeed, that is what we're doing. And we'll talk more about that, but, but there's an what we're building something around that purpose uh, that is very unique uh, in the marketplace. So Norm, it seems like it's a purpose-driven company, not a purpose created in the marketing department. Yeah, I, I think many times, um, you know, marketers are probably the first to really hook on to purpose. Certainly it's in a lot of the literature that we uh, read and we hear about. Um, but the, the challenge is if purpose just lives in the marketing department or just lives in the CSR department, there have been a, many compelling, I think actually some excellent ads made about a company's purpose. Uh, and there are a number of CSR activities. I think we all feel the pressure on that and the responsibility for it. But those two, because they're at uh, either kind of uh, can live independently or what every company is doing, they, they aren't really enough about what a purpose is uh, in, a, in a company. And so you've really got to find a way to, uh, to, to, to demonstrate your commitment to that purpose that's, that's, that's meaningful. Uh, otherwise, I just don't think it has the same impact that, uh, that you really want it uh, to have. And so, so increasingly, um, others are in the company are, are getting interested in it. I, I would just suggest that, you know, my, as a marketer, my biggest mark of success is when a CEO claims my idea as their idea. And, 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 that, and, and so I think that's where you want to aim. A lot of companies are developing purpose statements at the moment, and you mentioned accessibility and being others centric. Anything else you would counsel? I would counsel um, thinking about what you're going to do to demonstrate your commitment to that. Um, I, I, I would also, say, I'll get to that in a second, but I think you should also feel like, what, understand what's the change management process to bring your company along in that. So who's involved in forming it? Uh, how do they feel about it? And what's the real emotional connectivity 
that your people have to the customers that you serve. Because if you can tap into that emotional connectivity, and there is in every business, you can find a situation that it's there, then that can become the nugget upon which you wrap your purpose. It's very well documented, Norm, that you activated that purpose first by removing tobacco from the stores. Now, the fact that tobacco is the number one source of preventable death in the United States was not a new insight. Right. What inspired you to affect that change? And what was the calculus? Because clearly there were revenue implications. Yeah, there were. Uh, to be clear, uh, we were uh, making $2 billion in sales on the sale of tobacco. So it was no easy decision. And particularly for a public company in which there are stock market analysts who want to know what your earnings are and what your earnings growth rate is going to be. So when you change one of those two things, it could have a negative impact on your stock. And there was worry about that for sure. I think like in many companies, the idea of not being in tobacco or the idea of what a company could do that would make a real difference had been around for a while, uh, to your point. Uh, and, uh, and so it was, it was looking for the catalyst to drive when we can implement that purpose. And what we decided was that we, when we looked at the business strategy, the business strategy, we said that the future of the CVS pharmacy business, a business that you know is a pharmacy, some beauty, some health, but also a bit of a convenience store in the front, right? Uh, uh, was actually going to be really about health. So it started with the business strategy. The business strategy was that it was going to be more about health, and then it became clear: well, how are we going to uh, to to be about health? And so we. Uh, you know, because you want to tell people, oh, no, we're about health now. And they say, yeah, that's great. I, I see every day. I, you know, I don't, <laughs> whatever. We'll see if it's different or not. And so you actually have to find a way to disrupt, disrupt per perceptions about your brand today in order for people to be uh, on the path to better understanding you. And so we looked at that and said, well, if we could disrupt perceptions of, their, of our commitment to health. So, so in other words, maybe you didn't think we were committed to health. So now we get out of tobacco, we, we, we lose $2 billion in revenue. If we can disrupt perceptions that we're committed to health, now people think we're committed to health, how does that drive increased choice for our business? And one thing that's important to understand in all of that is that our stores are, uh, uh, well, at the time, we're less than half our revenue. We, we own uh, a couple of other insurance businesses for prescriptions and things like that. Um, uh, and so we could look at the whole portfolio and say, if we could sacrifice, uh, you know, selling $10 packs of cigarettes, perhaps we could win more $10 million contracts to provide the benefits to companies and insurance plans around the, the country. And, uh, and indeed that, that was true. Uh, when we got out of tobacco, it was such a visible sacrifice that it became clear to people that we really were uh, uh, walking the talk. And in the years following that uh, action, I mean, we increased our revenue by billions and billions of dollars. So you had a significant B2B component and part of the bet was that that would transfer given the great decision you've made on how it was so congruent with health goals. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and I think, you know, one of the things that we should just talk about um, is the impact of purpose on consumer choice. Um, uh, and I know, Margaret, you've asked me about this. Uh, and um, I, I think that it is important to consumers. I also believe that the data is a bit overstated. Um, uh, and if you don't have the right product at the right price or service at the right price, uh, uh, convenient to access with a good experience, it simply doesn't matter that you're purpose driven because you actually haven't delivered on the fundamentals for your consumers. And, and, and so when I hear uh, people saying uh, you should, consumers wanna drive from, uh, buy from purpose driven companies, I agree, but it has a big, but after it, but only after all of their basic needs are satisfied. 
Uh, and even, you know, even in fashion, I mean, people want to buy from companies, but, but what do you want first? You want something that looks good on you and, and feels good at a reasonable price. And if they don't have that, then, then the rest doesn't. So just to be clear, Norm, there's a lot of conversation about purpose. If I'm hearing you correctly, you are saying it's not an excuse to not get the other attributes right. And in your world, value, convenience, uh, mm -hmm. assortment, yes. you, you can't abdicate on those requirements as well. That's right. And indeed, it could make you seem distracted from delivering on the basics. Very interesting. Talk to us about the employee implications of that decision. So you've discussed tobacco. Were there other innovation unlocks? Yeah. What, what's next and what followed on from tobacco? How did you keep that momentum? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I believe that, that the number one impact of being a purpose-driven company is actually on your employees and the impact on them drives growth. And so let me talk about that for a second. <clears throat> Just go to society. We all uh, want to feel like we're part of, uh, you know, kind of creating the future, influencing the way things are going to roll out and affect our lives and others. That has a lot to do with purpose. And so people are increasingly looking to join companies that are aligned with uh, their values and interests. And so that's really important. When a company says it has a purpose, meaningfully commits to that purpose through actions and activities, it inspires their employees who have joined for that to feel really committed and engaged. And then that engagement drives more innovation, which drives more growth. And I'll, I'll give you an example of what happened at CVS. We got out of tobacco, uh, which uh, everyone felt really, really good about. I think it had the big, highest impact on our engagement scores in the history of the company. Uh, and in the years after that, uh, what happened was a ripple effect. Uh, it became very clear to uh, everyone in the company that you could advance your career by doing something to demonstrate our commitment to our purpose, but it had to be profitably. We can talk about that. Uh, and, and so what happened in the years after, when, when, the, when the price of EpiPen went to $600, our teams worked with a generic manufacturer to come out with one that with a coupon was around $10. That's helping people on their path to better health. When it became clear that sunscreen with SPF below 15 didn't work, uh, we took it off our shelves. Uh, more people get skin cancer than all other cancers combined. And so that's an important thing to do. We, uh, uh, another um, uh, merchant saw that um, the, the way beauty sales were being driven and growing was, was through uh, uh, social, through Instagram and YouTube, where people were much more authentic. That led to us making a commitment to say, we're no longer going to retouch any of our photos. And if you're going to sell products in our stores, any be big beauty brand, L'Oreal, Revlon, all these, you, uh, you have to disclose if you're materially changing photos because we wanted to demonstrate our commitment to authenticity, helping people on their path to better mental health. Because it turns out over 80% of people feel worse after seeing a typical beauty ad and the industry works on selling insecurity. And so, so we were the first to get out of artificial trans fats and, and chemicals of concern in our beauty products. My point is that that, that first activity that first commitment led to a ripple effect in which it created innovation against that purpose throughout the company. And that led to differentiation and growth for the company. Got it, Norm. And I see a question coming in, staying on the theme of commitment and employees regarding your commitment to supporting the BIPOC employees and the community in general. So it's the diversity and inclusion question. Yeah. I think companies have an obligation to reflect the society in which they operate uh, and uh, the, you know, the positive aspects of that society, but also the, the, the demographics of that society. Uh, and so when I, when we think about that, it's, it's really important. Uh, it's, it's really important that um, we're making a difference in all communities, not just some communities that happen to be larger or more accessible. It's really important that we're employing a population that reflects the communities that we want to serve. And frankly, you know, I, to be really honest, like all companies, I think in our stores, you actually see that pretty well because they're in these communities. I think when you get to corporate offices, we have more work to do. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think we just, uh, we have an obligation to create the society that, uh, that we think um, is best for people.
uh, and, and and companies play a central role in that. I just don't see a separation between the obligations of improving a society and uh, the the goals of a company. Norm, you've also talked a lot about simplicity and part of helping people on a path to better health is making it available to them in easy ways. Uh, could, could you speak about the importance of that and that's role in your purpose execution? At the core of simplicity is empathy. Uh, empathy is uh, feeling of, you know, putting your shoe, yourself in other's shoes. So when you make things simple for them, you're thinking about how can I help them? How do I make this better for these people who are trying to do something in healthcare, particularly a very emotional space, you know? So the more we can make things simple to understand, simple to use, simple to access, it makes a huge difference for people because it takes a mental load off of them. But I, I think you can go beyond healthcare into essentially every aspect of our lives. I mean, we all love... Uh, the things that can be done with as little effort as possible. Uh, and um, uh, there's actually a lot of uh, work, academic work on the importance of simplicity, but, and also on the, the idea of the effortless experience and how it drives loyalty and satisfaction. If you get to brands today, brands are really built 75% out of experience today. So, and simplicity is a way to have a great experience. Certainly, we've moved from the old paradigm of just words and pictures and advertising yeah. to indeed experiences. Now, in the context of the drugstore, the, the corner store, if you will, many consumers have many options to procure the products that you have. And what's intriguing about the CVS health story is in many ways, the migration from being somewhere that distributes other people's brands to becoming a brand yourself and migrating from the model where it was really a real estate play. Yeah. Talk to us about that. That's, that's quite remarkable in the retail category. Yeah, well, you're right on. Um, uh, you know, we, we built a business by putting a store close to people's homes. Uh, you know, so it was the easiest place to access things. Uh, the internet, makes a lot of things online the easiest place to access things. And so that real estate advantage, while still an advantage uh, is, uh, for, for products is, uh, is diminishing. And so what we need to do now is have people not just use us because we're convenient to their house, but also use us because they value something and what our brand has to offer. Uh, and so where it used to be, I know I want the head and shoulders. Oh, CVS has it. Now it has to be, I want to go to CVS because of blank and, I'll, and, and I can get my stuff there. Uh, and, and so that is a huge difference, all driven by digital, um, the evolution of, of, of digital. I would, I, interestingly enough, um, on the healthcare side, where we don't sell products that everybody else sells, uh, we are making uh, the, our convenience advantage, our physical convenience advantage plays a huge role. Uh, so like you think about we're, we're changing uh, about a thousand stores over into uh, what we call uh, health hubs, you know, local, mm -hmm. local services. And by bringing them closer to people where they live uh, and enabling that human interaction face to face, uh, we're really, we've really tapped into some, some demand there. So I think on the, on the product side, we absolutely have to build a better brand. It will inevitably be for us around how we can help you with health. Uh, and then the omni-channel in-store component helps with health. So it kind of takes two leaps there. Health is an interesting category in digital, isn't it? Because the normal currency of health reviews, et cetera, it's hard for people yeah. to see themselves in that. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I just remember an experience looking for probiotics uh, and seeing reviews, uh, first of all, I don't really know what, I mean, there's like, you read, they have a trillion of something in them, whatever it is, but, but so then you read the reviews and the reviews say, oh, work great for me, or I, uh, I didn't like it, or I used it on my dog, literally a review I saw. So then you're like, you're kind of left with, I have no idea is this is right for my health or not. And so the role of expertise plays a much bigger, uh, well, expertise plays a much bigger role in the decision process um, in health. Norm, on the topic of expertise, questions coming in on the chat around AI and emerging technologies. Yeah. Are you seeing any opportunities there in terms of providing better health to your customers? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, so we have um, AI deployed uh, in multiple parts of our organization. Um, uh, I'll give you a very simple one, just in our loyalty program, using AI to identify, looking through all the behavioral data to identify which product to which person at which time with which offer has unlocked a, a lot of value for us. But you can also think about uh, it on the health side. It turns out that health insurance companies uh, know the most about your health. Uh, and that is because they see all the claims, right? So, mm -hmm. so they can see all the claims. And, and so, that, so they're able to run AI to really understand what every individual's next best health action should be which is pretty cool. I think the challenge that um, a lot of consumers have is that they don't believe that health insurer, insurance companies have the same motivations that, that they have, uh, and, which isn't necessarily true. And also uh, it, it's a real advantage for CVS because we own Aetna, the insurance company, and we have this trusted brand in CVS. And so we can take the knowledge they have and the trust that CVS has and put them together to make a difference for consumers. Norm, I'm watching the chat diligently and you have many loyal CVS customers. Um, so ha happy to report that. Right. A question on the management side, many executives here in the audience intellectually conspire with you on the merits of purpose. What I know from my experience and from talking to many, the question becomes, what do you say to a board or a CEO that says, we've got to focus on the bottom line? I say, yes, that is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> that, that, that I say, absolutely. Uh, but it is not the only thing we should be focused on. Uh, and, uh, and if you focus only on that, you will find yourselves making subpar decisions for your long-term growth. And you will find yourself uh, with higher employee turnover and less of a brand loyalty uh, in, in the, uh, uh, to the company. So I would advance a more balanced scorecard, but there is no question that profitability matters. Uh, and uh, we're, I'm not, you know, this isn't, this isn't a nonprofit. We're a for-profit company that's doing things. Our job is to profitably improve the lives of people and society profitably. If we don't do it profitably, we go out of business and we're not achieving our purpose. And so I say to them that, yes, I agree with you. Bottom line is important but purpose can unlock growth, both through uh, the innovations it drives and the engagement in employees you, you, you see. Norm, there is so much discussion about purpose right now. What in your view is missing from the discourse? I think it's really hard, but imperative for companies to, meaning, to, diff, to meaningfully demonstrate their commitment. That, that, that beyond CSR, you know, you got, what, what are you, re, what hard choice are you really making beyond CSR? And by the way, I'm not saying negative things about CSR. I, those are great activities. I, I just think that many companies have those. So if you just do that, your employees will think, oh, well, that's great. You ran an ad and you, and you repurposed your CSR activities to be packaged under here, but we're still the same company we always were. And I don't think you have to be that way. Uh, you, you can do it. Now, some people don't have the, uh, something as big as tobacco to get out of, but then I would say, find a way to do the things you can do in a unique way and do a number of them so that they build up over time. Questions coming in on COVID. What's changed post COVID? Obviously CVS is very visible in testing and now in vaccines. Yeah, COVID, uh, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> It's consuming. Um, we, we have become the largest um, uh, retailer doing COVID testing in America. Uh, I think we might be the largest uh, doing the COVID vaccine. It um, has been a really meaningful and important moment for the company to help out uh, with uh, society uh, and so many people who need that help. So that's, it's been a huge uh, effort for us, a huge effort. I mean, you know, we meet on it every day, literally as an executive team, every day we meet on it to figure out how we're, uh, how we're addressing the changing situation. And uh, I think, you know, for consumers, it's never made it more clear that health is everything uh, and that they need to, you know, what you, 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 you know, you kind of want to make sure it's good and get it out of the way, but it is really, really important. And so we can play a bigger role 
and helping people feel better about their health, not just from the COVID vaccine or getting tested, but through all the stuff that, that we can do through Minute Clinic and pharmacy and things like that. You, were, and, you, you uh, mentioned profitability as being imperative. Yeah. Did any of your other internal metrics change? Questions here coming in around measurement, around the efficacy of the, pro of the purpose mandate. Absolutely. You saw meaningful changes in our in perceptions of us as a leader in health amongst uh, uh, healthcare influencers, policymakers, Wall Street, uh, definitely. We saw meaningful lift in uh, perceptions of us as a health and wellness company, uh, which drives choice uh, in our business. Uh, and um, I mean, you know, what we saw the sort of change that you'd usually see in, in three or four years in one year. Uh, and that's important, not just because it strengthens the brand, but because that we know that those perceptions drive choice in our products and services. So, and we saw the highest movement in employee engagement in the history of the company. So um, they all moved, they all moved. Tremendous, well, thank you, Matt. And I'll just, um, I know Matt's coming back in momentarily. I'll just sum up some of the things that we heard for our audience. I think we learned from you, Norm, fundamentally the power of purpose and the need for it to be a meaningful purpose, not to be merely generated in the marketing department, but to be a purpose-driven company. We heard that accessibility, meaning it's very achievable by all and mm -hmm. very other centric are important. Yes, yes. You also recognize that it cannot be separated from the core profitability metrics right. for, in a for-profit organization. It seems in listening to you that to achieve the kind of success that you've achieved, we need to recast purpose as not a marketing activity or limited to a CSR program, but rather an entirely new way to unleash innovation, to capture the gains from improved uh, customer perception and to galvanize employees. So I believe those are significant takeaways and maybe a more fundamental one of all in keeping with the theme is being bold. It was a bold move. And it, as we wait for Matt to return, I would offer a final question to you personally, Norm. It's a little um, spontaneous, if I may. Okay. What is your personal purpose? I love helping people achieve their potential. And I believe that most people through some circumstance uh, are not achieving as much as they could. And I feel almost an obligation to help them do that. 